there's two sides to every story, and I don't ever hear any Egyptians tell their side of the story. <laughs> but the Egyptian records show that back in the Bronze Age, there were the Hyksos, which means the rulers of foreign lands, that took control of the Delta region for a couple hundred years. So everybody's heard about the Hebrew captivity and how the Mino Pharaoh just didn't like them for no reason whatsoever. Or better yet, he was actually jealous of them because they were doing so good. They were being fruitful and multiplying, so he had to make them all captives. By the way, this is how artists envisioned all of that going down in the Middle Ages. But you got to keep in mind, until Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in the early 1800s, late 17, the Western world had no idea what ancient Egypt actually looked like. But they had all heard the story of the Hebrew captives. So they're just going to draw it like the world that they know. But is that the way the story really went down? It seems like there'd be some record of this in the ancient Egyptian archives. And it's kind of interesting that the Bible says that Pharaoh chased the Hebrews out with horse and chariots. But historians think that the Hyksos introduced chariots to Egypt. And it wasn't until the expulsion of the Hyksos that Egypt even had a standing army. But the Egyptian records don't show any event of mass captivity back in this time frame. But they do have record of the Hyksos, which does happen to be Semitic people from the East, which scholars really like to refer to as Asiatics in this one particular instance, because at this time the Middle East was Asia. But these Asiatic Hyksos came over and took control of all of northern Egypt and literally split ancient Egypt into two different kingdoms, which raises the question here, did these Asiatics invade northern Egypt? Egypt, and then when they got kicked out, claimed that they had held them captive. Well, let's look into that. Now, I know there are a lot of Christians that think that the Bible is the divine word of God, every last word in there. And I was taught and used to think the same thing. But I now think that Jesus came to free the world from the Old Testament and the law of Moses. But I'm not going to get into all that here. I've got other videos talking about it. But if you're a Christian, just Check your beliefs at the door. You can pick them up on the way out. And let's just take a realistic look at the world at that time. First off, even though a lot of people have tried to argue that there is archaeological evidence of the Exodus, I haven't seen it. They use things like this as clear evidence of the Exodus and say this is clearly where Moses struck the rock with his staff and water came gushing out. Well, then Moses was a really well-traveled guy because he did this, and then he did this one, and I've seen these all over the American West. And I've seen the clickbait jockeys on YouTube saying, this is clear evidence of them just cutting rocks with lasers for no reason. They just cut it in half and flew back to their home planet or whatever. This ain't rocket science. It is science, though. Even in the desert, it rains from time to time. And if you've ever spent the night in the desert, you know that it can get frigid cold out there. So water gets into a crevice at the top, then it freezes and expands and it splits the stone. It's the exact same as when we do this intentionally with feather and wedge. And if you don't think expanding water is strong enough to crack a rock, put water instead of antifreeze in your engine on a freezing night and see what happens. And that's high carbon steel. Anyway, no, I don't think Moses had anything to do with this rock splitting. And any desert will leave things in a state of almost perfect preservation for a very long time. And if there were tens of thousands of people wandering around out here for 40 years, there would be all kinds of evidence everywhere. You'd have evidence of cooking fires, broken tent poles. And if you make a smelting oven big enough to pour a golden calf, there's going to be evidence left behind. But we haven't found any of it. Now, I never got too big into the history of ancient Egypt because it had been done to death in the early days of YouTube, but I find it really strange that you have thousands of years of history from early dynastic down to the old kingdom, and then the new kingdom. And this new kingdom is the most famous of all of them. Starting with the 18th dynasty, Egypt achieved the peak of its power. Well, this just happens to be when traditional Egypt was invaded or had his power usurped, which we'll get to in a second. But screw the thousands of years of actual Egyptians, and let's celebrate when foreigners came in and took over their land. 
But yeah, academia isn't biased in any way. But the 18th dynasty is praised because of its wealth and its power. And I've heard this argued between scholars, but just look at the names, Tutmos, Amos, where Tutmos means born of the god Thoth, Amos of Amen, like Amen-Ra, where the main character of the Bible is named Moses, which in Hebrew is just M-O-S-E, pronounced Moshe. So the main character of the Bible shares the same name as all of these pharaohs, which I know he's supposed to be raised as a prince of Egypt. And we say this is Hebrew, but it's actually Yiddish, which is German and Hebrew combined, supposedly, because Hebrew was a completely dead language for thousands of years. And then in the 1800s, they decided to revive it. And I think they're being generous with the dating, putting it back in the 1800s, because it wasn't until the Balfour Declaration and mass migration to the Holy Land that anyone actually started speaking this language. Now, scholars pretty well all agree that the Hyksos were Asiatics, quote-unquote, from Canaan. But it's disputed on how they came to power. We have one lone author named Manetho, who supposedly lived 1,200 years after the Hyksos had been kicked out of Egypt, and Manetho was an Egyptian, if he existed at all, and you'll see why I'm saying that. And that they came sweeping in chariots blazing from Canaan, the northeast, and conquered the entire Nile Delta region. Now, what's up, everybody? I was in a hurry the other morning and didn't get to talk about this in as much detail as I wanted to. But let's just start off with a simple common sense question here. Here's an arch truss. If I pull the support out from under the right side, what is going to happen to the structure? I'm guessing almost everybody would say that it's going to fall down on that side. But how many people said it'll break in half right here in the middle? Okay, if you answered that, you're not invited to the rest of the conversation here because that's absurd. This is a structural member no different than if you have a board sitting on two columns. If you pull the support out from under the right side, then the board falls down on the right side. It doesn't all of a sudden break in half under its own weight. But that's exactly what happens here. Look, it just broke in half for no reason whatsoever. Let's look at this slowed down a little bit. You can see that the center of the bridge is falling faster than the support is. Now, do you think that has anything to do with all this molten metal that you see right here? Let's watch it sped up again and look right here. I mean, it's literally leaving a smoke cloud in the sky, which some of that in the background is from the ship itself. But... This is ridiculous. They have every news channel in the world has professional engineers on to talk about everything except for this. Let's talk about how old the bridge is. Let's talk about the code back in the 70s. Let's talk about how ships are twice as big as today as they were when this was built. Let's talk about everything except for the slightest little bump just sent this thing tumbling. And how there are sparks flying up from every single key stress point on this bridge. I was talking over the center one, but look right here. This is a key spot transferring from the pylons up to the arch. And then you see this boom right there. Uh, Those had already separated by at least 50 feet or so, and then all of a sudden you see the sparkage. Here's a straight line across there, and you can see this point right here is leading the way to the ground. The center of the arch, which is no different than standing a 2 by 4 up on edge and then removing... The support from one side of it. Now here's the center span and other pylon. You saw that flash of sparks there and then in this area you see all kinds of stuff going on and you know you could argue that that was electrical cables breaking but it looks an awful lot like what's coming up here right here. Big huge shower of sparks, molten metal thermite kind of stuff and then boom! What's all that? This is steel and concrete, right? You even see the same thing at the last few stages of where the ship actually hit, going up right there. Just all kinds of showers of sparks going everywhere. And if you haven't seen the actual bearing of the ship, uh, here you go. Now, they say that they lost power, but it looks like they roll in a bunch of coal while they lost power. To make that huge right turn, 
and hit just pretty much as squarely as they possibly could. And you see how it just crumbles. This is seriously like bad video game physics. That should have pushed over and fallen towards us, not just fall straight down. This thing to me, you can see that the center of the span is what is leading the way down. It's not where the support column was taken out. And it's not suspicious at all that the feds immediately said, no foul play, we'll pay for everything, don't worry about it, don't ask any questions. But even though this isn't even one of the top 10 ports in America, this is going to devastate shipping. Our supply chain will be run for five years. Anyway, these detonations were a little bit too soon, and the center of that span shouldn't have started failing until the other side had hit the ground and caused it to fail. But it's the center of the span with no structural damage whatsoever that's leading the way down. And there's an awful lot of sparks going everywhere for a bunch of steel and concrete. Static 